So I think maybe we can start and if people trickle in, I'll just uh, let them in. Um, so here with us today, Enrico Bastini to talk about philosophical poetry in the early modern period. Enrico, the floor is yours. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, thank you and all the organizers for accepting to host this uh, unusual subject. Um, yes, I'll, I'll share now a presentation. Of course, it worked before the seminar. I hope it works now too. So this is the subject, philosophical poetry in the early modern period. And, uh, and, and if you can't see my presentation uh, at this uh, address, uh, it can be seen directly uh, and, uh, and bigger and, uh, and things. Uh, it, it has just appeared before me uh, uh, a message that said when my internet connection is unstable. So uh, I, I hope it works. Well, in the abstract, I started saying that philosophical poetry is a curious kind of stuff. And in fact, it is. But that's why I, I'm so grateful that you let me speak about it. So what is uh, uh, philosophical poetry? Again, in the, in the abstract, I wrote something like this. Sometimes poets do philosophy. Sometimes philosophers write poetry and sometimes philosophy is written as poetry, I would add. And so in the junction of these aspects, uh, our subject dwells. Uh, uh, I, I, I'll be a bit more serious than the things that I wrote in the presentation. So sometimes I'll skip some of the most uh, apparent uh, nonsense. Uh, for me, this, uh, this philosophical poetry thing is a small project that I'm doing partly with others and it, it's in the form of an online seminar on philosophical poetry that began this year and will be repeated during next year. Of course, online was necessary during 2020. Uh, it will be again necessary in 2021 because I'm not anymore in my, in my university. So I, I must find a way to keep connections with other people. And apart from that, it is a Zotero group. Zotero is a bibliographic software. Uh, and so it is in fact a bibliography on philosophical poetry. And maybe if I do this, you manage to, to see the group. Uh, anyone can make a, an okay sign so that I know that you really see the group and not my presentation. No one does it, so most likely you don't see that. So let's see if now you, you get to see. And, and it contains this, uh, this uh, bibliography and the short uh, description of, of the thing. And there are very few members in this group, which is uh, something I'm not really happy about. And, and as you can see, there are very different kinds of things in this bibliography, and that's pretty it. Um, and it is part of a wider project, but it is a project of mine, so I'm not sharing it with very many people, on the historical variety of philosophical writing. So short forms, essays, poems, uh, songs, uh, and, uh, and so on, uh, that historically have, have been used by philosophers to write philosophy, uh, which now is quite disappearing, so there is what can be termed a, a loss of graphodiversity as uh, something similar to biodiversity in today's prevalently academic philosophy. And also in a situation in which poetry has become something that it was not in, uh, in previous times. So what is poetry today to, to be able to, uh, to be a means for the expression of philosophical doctrines? Um, so this is the background and why I'm studying this kind of things. Of course, this does not imply uh, an advocacy of philosophical poetry per se, so as, as if it were something good in itself. Uh, so consider, for example, and I'm sorry, I, I will be saying 
partly nasty things about Francis Bacon, who is a philosophical hero for so many of us today here. So he's, he's, he, he composed very successfully essays, now somewhat forgotten because they have been shadowed by Montaigne's essays or by Hume's philosophical essays, but they were an important component of his fame in his days. They were translated into Latin and were uh, spread all over Europe, but he was also the composer of very bad poetry. Uh, mostly they were unsuccessful poetical translations, for instance, of the Psalms. Uh, they, they were uh, considered even by contemporaries horrible. And he wrote a single one original poem, which is really not so good and we'll get back to it later. So the golden age of, polit of philosophical poetry is of course not the early modern period, it's antiqu antiquity. So not really hobbits and elves, even if they, they are considered to have written uh, poetry, inspired poetry, not precisely Gilgamesh, although the problem of the beginning of philosophy is always an interesting one, but uh, I'll, I'll skip it completely, Socrates. Uh, I, I think that although philosophical poetry has, had already been produced, the first problematization of philosophical poetry in itself. So the fact that a philosopher may write poetry and this poetry may have a philosophical content uh, is found in the Phaedo. And it's when Socrates tells of his dream, of his recurrent dream of a voice that, tell him, that tells him Socrates, Socrates, you must uh, uh, write and compose and perform music, that is poetry with music. Uh, I, I did a thing about that and uh, you find the, the address here, but it's in Italian, so uh, many of you could not be really interested in it. Um, it's a discussion of how this in fact could be the first moment in which a philosopher poses himself the problem of writing poetry and writes some poetry with the philosophical content. And so the first appearance of, of the thing. Then you have Aristotle saying that poetry uh, is better than history because of certain reasons and so on. But anyway, antiquity, this means Greek philosophy, the obvious for Manities and many others. Latin philosophy, so the obvious Lucretius and not so many others. Uh, and, uh, and you have uh, uh, middle age philosophical production in which you might discuss the problem of the presence of philosophical poetry, but in fact, medieval philosophy has uh, uh, from this point of view, uh, two important uh, difficulties, poses two important difficulties. One is the trilingual circulation. So Latin, uh, uh, Hebrew and Arab philosophy. And so the fact that you should be able to find philosophical poems also in languages that many of us do not really, uh, do not really command, uh, especially in the medieval, uh, version. And the fact that in uh, uh, even if in the medieval production that we currently normally know of, didascalic or didactic poetry prevails, uh, I brought it, oh, I, I, I made a typo, sorry, uh, prevails with an I and no E. Uh, uh, and so philosophical poetry is drowned uh, by general didascalic poetry. Uh, so my point of view on uh, medieval philosophical poetry is that in front of these two difficulties, uh, I, I, won't, uh, I won't speak about it. I'll do now an intermission be before going to, uh, in fact, my proper subject of, uh, of, of, of the now. In recent time, philosophical poetry is mostly practiced by poets. And I have a good example which of course uh, won't appear now because I, I, I went forward and, uh, and backwards. Uh, 
and so the image does not appear very slowly it manifests itself and this is good for philosophical tenets this is a poem in which you can read the thing described nor false facts in mind it is an artificial thing that exists in its in its own seeming plainly visible yet not too closely the double of our lives and so on and so on and um, and it goes on like that uh, the future is description without place some of you may have recognized now the, the, the poem in question the categorical predicate the art so this is an over philosophical poem and uh, and this over philosophical poem has even allusions um, <laughs> allusions uh, allusions to uh, to things that have to do with the the, the philosophical discourse of the time uh, i'll skip Peace and move to the last uh, uh, slowly appearing manifestation of, uh, of, uh, of this poem that now reveals itself to be description without place by Wallace Stevens. I think that it's a 1943 poem. And it is a very philosophical poem on uh, appearance, description, place, future, present, life, and so on, in a very philosophical language. And, and it is one of the main examples of philosophical uh, poems in the 20th century. So back to early models. So in between, in between uh, the, the golden age, in between the uncertain period of, uh, of uh, medieval philosophical poetry and 20th century philosophical poetry, mainly written by poets, there's the early modern period. Early moderns revive antiquity. And so uh, they, they take the, uh, uh, the expressions uh, by poets as uh, oracular. Uh, oracular truths and, and this is Giovanni Pontano in his De Sermone. Uh, the first appearance of the expression philosophical poetry that has some importance is this one. In fact, 1573, the collection of Greek philosophical poems that Henri Etienne Stephanus published under the title Poesis philosophos, poesis philosophical. So Empedocles, Parmenides, Xenophons, uh, and so on and so on. And, uh, and thus we come to the subject of tonight or for people who are in another, uh, in another place on the globe of this afternoon. I, I might at, at this point drop some names. Uh, some casual names in the sense that when I wrote the following slides, I, I, uh, I did quite casually, but more names will come in the following. So there are poets, Schiller, Hölderlin, that are uh, whom a philosophical allure is, record, is recognized, and we have Shelley, who programmatically wrote a philosophical poem that is Queen Meb. We have uh, uh, Lorenzo il Magnifico with famous poems uh, uh, of which one is uh, really philosophical and is the ugliest. In fact, Palingenio Stellato, who wrote at Zodiacos Vite, which is a philosophical astrological poem, Fra Castoro, who is famous for his works on syphilis, to which he devoted an important poem, which is in fact his main work on, on this theme, and who wrote a, a Urania on his uh, uh, astronomical ideas, which were, um, which were wrong, strong, strongly, deeply wrong. And Giordano Bruno, of course, who uh, put many short philosophical poems in his uh, Italian dialogues and who wrote uh, many important Latin works in the form of philosophical poems, of philosophical Latin poems. 
we have, uh, I, I must mention Leibniz at least once uh, tonight, uh, there's Leibniz and the Affair Fragier, when uh, uh, Raymond proposes to Leibniz a, a French poet that could write a poem on monads. And so Leibniz writes a short Latin poem on monads that he sends to Raymond so that Fragier can read it and write a poem on monads. Uh, Fragier had written a poem on Plato and his uh, doctrine of uh, the immortality of, of the souls in French. And in fact, uh, Fragier is uh, remembered by Voltaire among the principal uh, poets uh, of, the, uh, of the Grand Siècle. Uh, Fragier won't write this poem. We have Leibniz's poem preserved in, uh, in, in, in the Leibniz Artif in, in Hanover. And, and it's interesting because it allows uh, us at this point to mention the question, the issue of, let's say, the distinction between good poetry and bad poetry, because Leibniz wrote at times good poetry, but this poem is very bad. And it's in fact an exercise of, of schoolboy poetry. He was very versed in producing Leibniz verses. And in fact, he boasts about the fact that he, when he was in school, he was able to write a poem of 100 Latin hexameters without elisions, so without tricks. To, to put the words into, into the verses. But in fact, he, he always writes Latin poetry like this, so bad poetry, which is made uh, quoting classical verses and joining them together with some, with some adaptation. And so uh, we also have the interesting issue of uh, bereavement uh, uh, instead of metaphysics as the inspiration for poems because Leibniz wrote a very inspired poem when Sophie Charlotte, the Queen uh, of Brandenburg, died, uh, who was for Leibniz as a daughter. Uh, maybe he was, she was Leibniz's daughter, uh, we, we don't know, but uh, she was the daughter of, um, of a not so intelligent prince in Hanover and of a very intelligent princess, but she was even more intelligent than her mother. And so uh, some have speculated. Uh, and this was uh, the so-called Epicadium on the death of a queen, which he wrote uh, in German, and, and which is very good poetry. Whereas, as I said, this one is not so good. And then we might mention Voltaire, Pope, Manville, uh, who were partly poets, partly philosophers, uh, and who wrote uh, in poetical form some of their principal works of thought. So works that contain their thought. And so they, they are fairly good examples of one possible function of, of philosophical poetry in early modern times. And then there is an infinite population of minor figures. And I like, I'd like to quote Jean Condencial. You don't know who Jean Condencial is, I suppose. Uh, I don't either. Uh, for me, he is the author of this book, Le Tableau de l'Inconstance Mondaine, where we can find this very fine uh, uh, stanza on time. Do you want to know what time is? It's a sphere that rolling doesn't touch on the, on the plane uh, then, but with a point. And so past is, uh, is, uh, is no more, present rolls and rolls uh, and future comes again, but it's not yet come. And the, the second part is just to have the rhyme with point. And, and this uh, idea of the time as a sphere that touches uh, uh, a plan with just one point is uh, is pretty philosophical in a way. Yet it is hardly more than a pretty and astute metaphor to explain a philosophical concept. Uh, but for for a nobody like this uh, Jean Condencial, it's a it, it's already a, a nice result. So uh, that's why I wanted to quote it. Uh, uh, and uh, and and. And I wanted to quote it also because it, uh, it brings about, about the question of what is really philosophical in philosophical poetry. 
the question, the, the, a good example could be this uh, that I wrote here is uh, Girolamo Benivieni's Canzone d'Amore, a philosophical object, because it's a poem on a philosophical subject that is very common in his time. So, so many philosophers, uh, Leone Breo and, and many others write about uh, love and uh, the definition and the principles and the ethics and the metaphysical role of love in the universe. Or is Pico della Mirandola's commentary on Benivieni's Canzone d'Amore a philosophical object? This is an important problem uh, that, uh, that let us ask also what, is really, what really is philosophical poetry. So the demarcation problem, so to say. Uh, demarcation means, are we speaking about poetry written by philosophers, quoted by philosophers? There's a whole uh, book that appeared recently on uh, 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 poetical quotes by Plato, for instance, as an integral part of his philosophical enterprise. Poems on philosophy or on philosophers. Uh, uh, there's an interesting stanza on Marsilio Ficino written uh, in, uh, as, as a dedication poem by a, a German in Wittenberg in 1570-something. Uh, which is an interesting example of philosophical poetry in, his, in, in that time. Poetry with the philosophical content and so on and so on. We won't drink from these cans now. We'll be open and, and, and leave the demarcation problem to, to another occasion. And I, I will discuss in some, uh, today the use that uh, uh, early moderns may make of philosophical poetry. So the use of philosophical poems. And, uh, and, uh, and why is it important uh, uh, to, or interesting, or just a way to spend some time tonight uh, uh, to discuss this in the early modern period? Because in the early modern period, there's some uh, appreciation of the connection between philosophy and poetry that uh, does not exist uh, in, uh, in other periods. I quoted here Montaigne from the Apologie de Raymond Sebon, et certes la philosophie n'est qu'une poésie sophistiquée. And really, philosophy is nothing but a sophisticated poetry. So, uh, of course, uh, Montaigne is always double entendre, so we must not take a quote like this at face value, but it's a, a, a symptom of, uh, of a perception. And apropos Montaigne, I'd like to, to make another quotation, and uh, that is from uh, Etienne Jodel. He writes an ode uh, dedicated to André Tevet, uh, who is the royal geographer, who had written about Antarctic France, that is the colonies. And, uh, and in his Melange Poétique, uh, we find this, uh, the, these verses. I lightheartedly uh, quote in French, or I should even more lightheartedly try to translate them into English. He, say, uh, he says, uh, people who would want to put blame on the, on the land that we must love would find the Arctic France, uh, uh, so France, proper France, uh, um, hosts more monsters, I think, and more, and more barbarians uh, inside itself than Antarctic France, that is, the, the, the uh, land of Hurons, uh, those barbarians uh, 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 go around naked, and here you see immediately Montaigne. This is uh, uh, written uh, in, 15, in the 1560s, 1570s, and uh, the edition I quote from is 1574. And we, uh, we go around unknown. Uh, uh, with, uh, with fart on our face, masked. Uh, so these are the typical uh, uh, themes that we find in Montaigne, just expressed in a poetical way, just, just like uh, I again will put together essays and poems uh, 
just like Montaigne had written it in Woodwright, it in his says. Ces barbares marchent tout nus et nous nous marchons inconnus. Par démasqué, ce peuple étrange à la piété ne se range. But we uh, despise our piety. Uh, we uh, we sell our religion. We mask. Uh, we we cash. Uh, we, we we hide our religion. And uh, this barbarian uh, for their life. Uh, maybe do not have so much reason as we have, but, uh, but we see that we use our reason just to, uh, uh, just to harm uh, ourselves and our, and our neighbors. So again, this is a, a theme that we can find easily in Montaigne, a, a, a flagship theme of Montaigne's. So, which are the functions that political, that, that philosophical poetry may have in the, among the, uh, the, the early modern philosophers. One is an exercise in commonplaces. So, so many of them do poetry because it's uh, socially good to, to write poetry. And my example is, alas, Baker. Uh, that's this, uh, this relatively famous poem by Bacon, the world's a bubble and the life of man less than span in his conception wretched from the womb, so to the tomb, and so on and so on. This is a stanza of this poem that repeats itself in this uh, awkward ver meter uh, for, for I think four or five stanzas on the theme uh, Homo Bulla and uh, the contempt to Mundi, the, uh, uh, the despise of the world and of worldly matters that should be typical of Christians and of the uncertainty of, uh, of worldly life and so on and so on, really commonplaces. Uh, uh, and apart from the poetical quality, it is clear that for him it is an exercise. Uh, something that he writes so that uh, in a feast or in a theatrical occasion or uh, to, to, uh, to console someone, he could make use of this. But it's not something that he would put his heart or, or his literary ability really in, just like he did in these essays, for instance. Okay. A second function could be that of a different medi medium to present one's philosophy, but a medium that is on a par with the others. And my example for this is Tommaso Campanella. To Tobias Adamis in his Prodromus Philosophiae Instaurande, in his preface to the philosophers of Germany, writes uh, Campanella Carmine Italico totam quasi philosophiam suam, iucundissimis hymnis repetit. He repeated nearly the whole of his philosophy in a very pleasant way in his fine hymns, in his fine poems written in Italian. And in fact, Tobias Adami is the editor, the first editor of Campanella's Italian philosophical poems. In this book, the scelta da alcune poesie filosofiche di Settimontano Squilla. Settimontano Squilla is a pseudonym of Campanellas. Squilla is an Italian word for, for a bell. So Campanella, Campana is a bell. A squilla is a bell, we find it uh, still in, uh, in 19th century Italian poems as, a, as an old word that can be used poetically, for instance, in Leopardi. And Settimontano means of the seven mountains because Calabria, uh, Campanella's region, is the region of the seven mountains. And, and so this is a choice of some philosophical poems of this guy. Uh, taken from his books at the Cantica, so in preparation of the whole poem, it, Tobias Adami, they are published in Germany, not in Italy, because it was not so easy to publish Campanella in Italy, but published in Curtin, uh, 
so uh, the, the main uh, city of Anhalt by the Prince of Anhalt's own press, the Prince of Halt, Anhalt Ludwig the, uh, the first, uh, who at that time had a printing press uh, put up in his uh, palace so that he could publish works in German and in Italian because he had spent some time in Italy and he spoke or thought to speak and write Italian very well. He had Italian works published, translated, and uh, he was uh, very interested in bringing German language uh, at the same intellectual level of a language like Italian. And he, he is one of the co-founders of the Fruchtbringende Gesellschaft, so uh, one of the first, maybe the first uh, academy in Germany. So this happens, the publication of these works by Campanella in the context of a major cultural project in uh, the Germany of the time, and they are presented as uh, the best incarnation of his, of his philosophy by uh, a group of people which is the main point of a network of diffusion of Campanella's works in, uh, in Germany, which is in fact uh, at the time. Uh, inside a culture and also political project very near to projects like that, like, like that of Valentin André uh, in northern Germany some, some 50 years before. So, uh, so it's, it's something, so to say. Another way to think of uh, philosophical poetry in uh, the modern, the, the early modern time is that it might be the best way to do philosophy. So this is connected to one person uh, and, and, and this person is Voltaire who repeatedly advocates this idea so that uh, uh, philosophy is at best written in poetical form because in this way it, it suits at best uh, the project of the enlightenment, enlightenment in the literal sense of enlightenment, enlightenment. So in the sense of the German of Klerung, bring light to the people, to the intellectual public as well as the less intellectual public, but at least capable of reading or hearing uh, something interesting. And, uh, and uh, uh, Irene Gwenel Boucher has even coined a word to, uh, to, uh, to describe this uh, straight connection, this alliage poetico-philosophique in uh, Voltaire's work, which is poesophie, and I mention it just because the word is so, is so, um, well, it's so uh, outwardly, but it's interesting. Uh, so for instance, uh, and, and I owe this quotation to Deborah Sicco, which is a, a, a very good Voltaire scholar in Italy. Uh, this quotation where he wants to make a compliment to a person and he says, you unite wisdom with imagination, you think like Newton and write like Lucretius. Vous réunissez la sagesse avec l'imagination et vous pensez comme Newton en écrivant comme Lucrèce. Um, he writes a poem on natural law, a, a discourse in verses on man, and this is an echo of Pope, of course, and he writes, Le Mondain, which is a poem on one of the most important philosophical themes in Voltaire, that is, uh, uh, Rousseau is wrong, um, um, life in the country is uh, boring, at best you should live in big cities, and so, and in the world, so Le Mondain uh, is the incarnation of this uh, philosophy of Voltaire's, um, so poems, philosophical poems are at least as much important to him as his philosophical novels or philosophical fables. 
Uh, and the best example of this is the poem Sur le désastre de Lisbonne, in which a, a whole component of Voltaire's thought and a developmental component, so something to which he arrives at a point uh, and for which he reads uh, uh, Leibniz's theodicy, even if he loved uh, Leibniz's philosophy in general, uh, he writes it not as a treatise, but in poetical form. So really for Voltaire, uh, uh, poems are the best way to write poetry. Uh, they can also be uh, an appealing embellishment of uh, philosophical production. And uh, I I'll quote uh, uh, a mystery man who writes about Voltaire uh, and, and other uh, philosophical poets, and he writes the ingenious and picturesque system of Cartesian vortices. Uh, uh, gives to poetry much more movement and images uh, than Newton's uh, arid and geometrical philosophy. Uh, nonetheless, uh, read the beautiful poems where Voltaire has uh, spoken about the system of the world and of the attraction of planets and, and, and so on and so on. Uh, so, I did something wrong here because I lost uh, uh, three other, <laughs> three other. I, I'll put at least the online version in 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 due form after the seminar. Uh, there were two other uh, parts of this quotation where uh, this guy goes on goes on musing uh, on uh, on philosophical poetry in. France and and I lost them completely. So what I should do could be no. Well, I, I won't do, and I just uh, um, get to them in, in in some other way, and and uh, and maybe you have already recognized the the person who writes this. It's a scientist who uh, who thought that he was. Uh, uh, a literate and uh, uh, a literary critic. And uh, he go, goes on saying, well, uh, Epicurus philosophy that Lucretius put into, into poetry is not truer than Descartes's. Uh, yet now everybody still uh, every day read uh, Lucretius and no one reads the Abbé Genet who had written a poem about, uh, uh, about Cartesian philosophy. And, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, and so this person is, uh, as you might have surmised, D'Alembert, writing about Voltaire that he didn't like that much. But, uh, but that in, in, as far as philosophical poetry was concerned, he thought that Voltaire was perfectly uh, able to put in, uh, into uh, uh, Philo in, in, into such poetry that, uh, that would merit eternal fame, uh, even a, a non-poetical philosophy like Newton's so on. And, uh, and of course, this is, uh, this is embellishment, not... Uh, uh, so the role of, uh, of Voltaire's verses, according to D'Alembert, is not the role that, that Voltaire would, uh, would have fought. Another function is communication of science. So the next time one writes a Marie Curie, one could say in the, during the third year, I would present a philosophical poem on the subject of my project. And, and I would like to quote three Italian uh, po poets uh, that were all, uh, uh, well, at, at least the first two more interested in philosophy than in poetry, but who thought that poetry was the best way to present, uh, to present philosophy to the ignorant people of Southern Italy, or to the ignorant uh, noblemen who could read but not understand philosophy of, of uh, um, Southern Italy or in the uh, 17th century, late 17th, late 17th and uh, first uh, and mid 18th, and then produce these poems. Uh, one is Tommaso Campailla, 
Adam or the created world. It's a poem where you, we have a situation like that of the Philosophus Autodidactus that was translated into Latin from Arab, where a guy awakes on a desert island and, uh, and begins to think over things and develops a philosophy. And there are uh, also works like this made by Cartesians where uh, a child is born uh, uh, in, a, in a desert place and re reflects about things. Adam, when, when he's created, knows nothing, but uh, by reflecting on himself, he realizes that he thinks, and, and so he exists. Uh, and this is very good uh, to, to situate Cartesian philosophy in the, in the earthly paradise, in the Garden of Eden. Um, and and after, some, after he has reached this, uh, this philosophical level, God uh, sends an angel to bring him to the library of the Garden of Eden. And then there's a beautiful uh, canto where, where we have description in verses of this library, which contains uh, the works of the most important Cartesians, of course, and, and uh, the most important philosophical works uh, that, uh, that Campaila could think of. Tommaso de Natali wrote uh, this uh, exposition of uh, Leibnizian philosophy um, uh, summarized in Italian verses. To Versi Toscani means Tuscan verses, but in fact it means uh, the Italian language that is spoken in Florence. And he, he did this uh, again uh, in a Voltairean way uh, as, a, as a way of uh, enlightening the people in Palermo, where he published it under a false uh, place of, uh, of, uh, of publication, uh, the Jesuits had the, the work immediately prohibited and seized, so that very few copies now exist. One is in Turin, so uh, in, the former, uh, in the former library of my university, and the other one is in Palermo, and the one in Palermo has been digitized, so if, we, if you want to read it. And then there's Horatio Righilandini, who was more of a poet, and he wrote the Temple of Philosophy, which is a description of his project for a, 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 um, a sepulcher for Newton, uh, with an explanation in verses of Newton's philosophy. So as you see, this is a provincial sort of enterprise. You do this kind of things if you live in a remote province where priests prohibit uh, uh, the public use of reason, and you want to find a way to interest people in, in things that otherwise would not circulate. Oh, okay, here is D'Alembert uh, uh, displaced uh, in uh, here. Well, I have already summarized this for you, so I'll skip it now, but it was this D'Alembert sur le point cartésien de la Bégenée and the quote, so you can find it. So I, I, I did not uh, uh, put it out, but just put it in the wrong place. Another uh, function, and I'm nearly reaching the end, as you can see from the slide counts in the, in the lower right corner, is a crowning, a crowning achievement in the career of a philosopher, and in this case of a philosopher. And this is, I think, the best example of poetical uh, poetry in the early modern era. So the most interesting, the most philosophical ambitious, uh, and maybe also the one that uh, uh, was, was best done, so that, that was uh, a, a, a masterwork. And this is uh, uh, by Helvetius. Uh, it is not so famous, but uh, it should be, is Helvetius uh, Le Bonheur, Poème en six chants, avec des fragments de quelques épîtres, it appeared posthumous uh, uh, in London, uh, but of course it was not in London, with the first biography of, uh, of Helvetius, uh, which was very well done. And uh, so, on, uh, on happiness, a poem in six uh, cantos, and maybe is his most relevant work. And I suppose uh, this is one of the reasons I, I wanted to mention it because it, uh, it's interesting that Helvetius uh, 
uh, wrote the most ambitious of his works. So the one that really concerns the most important philosophical question, that is how to be happy. Uh, it is the most philosophical question, even for philosophers that are very far away from, from Helvetius. Uh, it's, it could be framed as the most important philosophical question, even for, uh, for Plato in a way, but of course it is for Aristotle. And so it is really the most important philosophical question, and it is the most philosophical, important philosophical question for 18th century materialist French philosophers like Helvetius. And so, and he decides to write it in the form of a poem. The poem is not so bad. So most of the poems that I quoted today are worse, okay? Not, uh, not Stevens's work poem, but, but uh, Stevens is uh, one of the finest uh, English speaking uh, poets of the 20th century. So it's not really in the, in the same championship. Uh, but the other reason is, is, is that it allows me to mention this interesting problem. So the connection between historiographic activity and the gag reflex. Uh, historiographer, when they find a philosophical poem, they have a gag reflex. And so they vomit it out, just like uh, uh, in, the, in the Bible it's written, you are tepid and I will vomit you out of my, of my mouth. They vomit philosophical poems out of their mouth. And so uh, nearly no one writes on this, uh, on this work by Helvetius. Uh, and everyone thinks that the incredibly boring major in terms of dimension work by Helvetius is his most important philosophical work and the work to, to which he himself would have uh, uh, tied his posthumous fame, which is not true. And, and so I end here, uh, I, I think it's time to end. I end here with this quotation from a, from a, from a living poet, uh, from a poem entitled The Philosopher Did Not Say, and she says, why am I mining dead men for answers? when they were all as mad as I am, which is the fine uh, ending both for my, um, for my presentation and the fine epitaph for our work as historians of philosophy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Enrico. Okay, so if people have questions, please write them in the chat or uh, you have raised your hand, I can see your hand as well. Um, oh, Dan? Enrico, thank you so much. This was uh, very interesting, very charming. Um, I would add a few other names that I was surprised that you didn't uh, that you didn't uh, mention. Henry Moore wrote philosophical poems, of course. Sure. Um, and Margaret Cavendish did as well as as well as a philosophical novel. Um, it seems to me that it would be interesting to expand this also in the direction of uh, not just poetry, but also um, um, philosophical novels. I am thinking of uh, Gabriel Daniel and the Voyage du Monde uh, de Descartes. The Descartes. Um, there is, there is um, 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 Cyrano de Bergerac. Um, there are various other um, I think very interesting things. Well, one, one question though is, why is it that more people didn't actually do serious philosophy in this, um, um, in this mode? You do have the model of Lucretius, um, who was enormously popular in the um, 16th and 17th century. Um, <clears throat> And so far as I can tell, the only one who actually took up the challenge um, of writing anything like what Lucretius did for Epicurus is uh, Fagui, who um, attempted to do the Leibniz. Why was, why was 
Lucretia is not taken as a better model for. Uh, so, uh, well, Harry Moore was also mentioned just a moment before uh, your question began by Denis Dashi uh, in the chat. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, um, and so if, uh, if Claudia allows me, I'll answer to both of them in, in sequence. Perfect. Um, so you, of course, say more. There's a lot of people I could have mentioned. Uh, some I did not mention because uh, as mathematician do, uh, the, the mentioning of other, the, the raising of other examples is left to the, to the listeners as an exercise. Um, so, um, and, and the other reason is that for instance, I don't like Margaret Cavendish's poetry. Um, I barely stand her philosophy. I appreciate her stance, so the way, he, the way she writes, uh, which is uh, uncommonly interesting. Um, and in the sense that uh, her philosophy is also life, she's one of the outstanding examples of uh, early modern attitudes uh, towards uh, philosophical production. But her philosophical production is bad, and, and her philosoph and her poetical production is worse. And this we all know, even if it is some more, somewhat original, because so original is different from really good, good, of course. And and so there are at least a couple of reasons why Margaret Cavendish is very interesting when you do general history of philosophy, but she's not so interesting in in speaking about philosophical poetry apart from the, from the fact that she did some. Um, um, philosophical novel, of course, when I said uh, um, there's uh, an, an interesting treasure of different ways of writing philosophy and, and my own project, uh, the, the background project is on the variety, the, the graph of diversity, as I said, of philosophy. In the past, of course, philosophical novels are a part of it. Another very good example at the same period, which is uh, when Fontenelle revived the Lucanian uh, dialogues of the dead. And so was this whole production that in, especially in Germany was used to discuss philosophical issues. Why did not good philosophical poetry, uh, why was not uh, good philosophical poetry produced? I think one of the reasons is that uh, uh, for centuries, good poets uh, have a representation of themselves as poets and of poetry as such uh, that would uh, bar didascalic or didactic poetry from being considered as a good subject for poetry. And so good poets would very rarely write uh, uh, this kind of poetry. And it was deemed acceptable to write such poetry when one would uh, speak about uh, poetry itself. So one would write another as poetica and the, the art poetic uh, of Boileau, for instance is acceptable, but is already a diminishment of his poetical abilities to write that kind of poetry, or at least it was perceived like that. And so you find occasional philosophical poetry. So a good poet, poet could write, uh, for instance, a short poem uh, on uh, what uh, a young philosopher that is beginning his career should know. And there's a beautiful poet, poem, Latin poem by Conrad Celtis. Uh, I, I, I know that saying beautiful Latin poem means, uh, uh, well, it, it is good Latin poetry. No one of us would, would find it a beautiful poetry, of course, because the canons of beauty in Latin poetry and in Latin modern poetry are different, but Conrad Celtis is able to write uh, uh, beautiful and bawdy Latin poetry on his life, uh, the women that shaped it and so on. And so also when he tackles a bit of philosophy, he's able to do it in an elegant way. 
but these are occasional uh, poems or occasional you, uh, beats in, in uh, wider poems. Would you consider Milton, Paradise Lost, to be a philosopher? Yes, that was my next step. Uh, either you have uh, uh, single instances of a poet that will write a whole poem on things that we consider philosophical. John Donne, Milton, uh, certain parts of, uh, uh, of Goethe's works, in Second Faust, the, 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 the more boring part of the Faust, <laughs> and so on. Uh, and, uh, and it's difficult to say whether these are good or, or bad, uh, bad poetry, because uh, it depends on your taste on poetry. It, there's, uh, there's been a whole discussion in 19th century Italy about the fact that poetry should be pure poetry. And so when poetry is mixed with uh, with philosophy, with doctrine, with ideas, with concepts, it loses its uh, uh, character of, uh, of pureness. And so, for instance, Dante Alighieri, we, which produced a well-known uh, poem, which has, in fact, important parts that are philosophical, uh, really, really wrote poetry or not. Uh, and whether you could distinguish in Dante pure poetry from non-poetry. So poetry from non-poetry. And this is uh, tied to, to critical works by Benedetto Croce, which have had some diffusion also in the English speaking world. And that's why I mention it. Uh, and so in this case, you would say uh, these works of Milton are non-poetry from, from that point of view. Of course, from my point of view, it's, uh, it's poetry and it has a philosophical quality in many parts. Although, of course, writing about creation and uh, the Garden of Eden and the original sin and so on is not always what we would call philosophical. Here we have another kind of demarcation pro problem. Um, um, and uh, and uh, what had I to say yet? Yes, the fact that uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, Poets or philosophers would write philosophical poetry and comment on it, so explain it. Um, this is akin to what some poets do with their poetry. So it could be the, the case that poets sometimes feel the need to add commentaries to, uh, to, their, uh, to their poems. And this might not be a specialty of, uh, of philosophers who write poetry. But I, I really don't know. Uh, would, would it be okay if uh, Dennis read out his question so that people on YouTube can also hear what I'm, he asked? I, I, I was finished. Okay, so you don't want to say something about Henry Moore and commentaries? Well, uh, I, I don't think that Henry Moore is, uh, is an instance of anything. So he's not typical of what uh, um, philosophers do of what philosophical poetry is. Um, I could have used Henry Moore uh, instead of uh, Helvetius uh, to, uh, to, to show, well, oh, no, instead of Campanella, to, to show an example of a philosopher for whom the, po the poetical production is on the same level of uh, uh, dialogues and treatises. Uh, uh, Mm, but I like Campanella more. Okay, so then we'll move Are on we? to um, Hannah Benyami's uh, well, question. I, I see people in the audience who are relieved by this. So actually, there are a bunch of there are a bunch of questions that are about uh, Plato. Um, Hannah is one. Um, maybe the one from Tobin Craig on the uh, quarrel of um, philosophy and poetry might be one. So maybe uh, Tobin can go uh, first. Well, I was just going to, I was just going to challenge challenge the presentation a little bit in suggesting that it seemed to me that while you went a long way in suggesting various ways in which philosophy could be uh, poetic or adopt a poetic mode, you seem to presuppose that poetry is not 
and is not understood to be a radical alternative to philosophy. And um, when and where philosophers try to distinguish what they're doing from what the poets are doing, they um, seem to suggest that there's uh, something of a fundamental tension between the enterprise of poetry and the enterprise of philosophy. Uh, I think of, of course, the passages from Plato and um, certain passages in early modern thinkers uh, distinguishing uh, philosophy from poetry. So I don't mean this to undermine what you're saying, but it makes the manifest No, this is fact, too easy. It makes, it makes the manifest fact of a tradition of philosophical poetry more puzzling, I think, even more puzzling because of this um, um, understanding of poetry as, as genuinely an alternative. Well, um, I, I could use this. Uh, may I use this also to answer another question uh, where I was asked to explain something I said about Socrates? Yes. Because it, I, I would use it to answer this question. So, um, well, uh, first of all, this is far too easy to answer. Um, there's an answer of the kind of the cynicals in front of the Eleatics. You walk. Uh, there are so many philosophers that have written poetry that Pace Plato, po philosophical poetry exists. And so the fact that Plato uh, traces a sharp distinction between the philosophical enterprise and the poetical enterprise or philosophers and poets, uh, uh, mm, okay. Not every philosopher is, uh, ob is, uh, is uh, obliged to, to write poetry. In fact, uh, every philosopher can say, I like Plato and I don't write poetry at all. I, I, uh, I frame myself as a person who has nothing to do with poetry. I think 99.9% .9 of current uh, philosophers, let's say, who do metaphysics or philosophy of mind would, uh, would, uh, uh, would keep the stance, okay? Of course, I, I'll write something titled, uh, inspired by you, uh, Amicus Plato, Plato said Magis Amica Poesis. There's many philosophers who, who thought that they would write um, poetry. Um, what I meant uh, by Socrates is, uh, is this, and, uh, and it's interesting because it shows that even in Plato there's a problem concerning this point. Of course, there are people that we think are philosophers that wrote philosophical poems because Socrates. They did it naturally. And there's no distinction between uh, writing treatises and writing poems. Uh, we have uh, aphorisms of uh, ancient writers that might have been verses or might not have been verses. And we don't know just because we don't know anything before and after that single, uh, that single uh, stichius uh, of a philosopher. So uh, what I meant is a different point. So that Socrates, the first one that discusses uh, uh, the fact that a philosopher could write poetry and philosophical poetry, not because uh, he is a philosopher that writes his poetry in form of is his philosophy in form of a poem, just because he writes like that, but because he's a philosopher that at the moment decides to write something that is poetical and contains, uh, as Socrates says in that passage, logoi, that is reasoning, concepts. So something that normally should not pertain to poetry. And Socrates briefly discusses that before saying, and so I decided, I decided to put in mu into music Aesop's fables. And, uh, and the fact that Plato has uh, Socrates study music, discuss uh, music and things with uh, women, and, uh, and, uh, and Plato also uh, draws sharp distinctions between himself and women, nonetheless, Socrates is one of the first to, uh, to be in a situation in which a woman teaches philosophical matters to a man philosopher. And so Plato has complexities that we should not uh, simply um, 
um, maybe simply obliterate. Okay. Maybe here is a good a good moment to bring in Lisa Shapiro's uh, question. Lisa, would you mind uh, reading it? Which one? Um, it's 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 uh, way at the top. I, uh, yeah. So sorry, Thank I um, my internet connection is unstable. So. I'm going to leave my video off. Um, and I also got kicked out of the Zoom and so lost the text of my question. But really, I, it was more just, um, I noticed uh, on your Zotero bibliography, you don't have any works by uh, Sor Juan Inez de la Cruz, who is a 17th century Mexican poet, uh, philosopher, who quite self-consciously um, chose to do her philosophy in poetry um, and just uh, and and the Spanish literature people read her as being um, really a kind of uh, a extraordinary example of a poet in the period a Baroque poet um, so she made advances in the art of poetry in Spanish literature um, and, and so really, I guess her case, and this is just something, a, a general question that I don't think you need to know anything about Sorwana to be able to, to answer is whether um, the poetic form itself uh, contributes any philosophical content um, or whether it's uh, the philosophical content would be the same, whether it was delivered through a poem or in an essay or in a fable or some other. So whether the form actually has philosophical value in itself. Thanks. I'll so thank you. Uh, well, it's a beautiful question and thank you for introducing Juana Inez de la Cruz. Uh, yes, uh, I, I'm not able to uh, to, ap to really appreciate the, the philosophic, the, the poetical quality of, uh, of her work. Um, and I don't know enough, uh, as you correctly suggested, <laughs> to discuss it. So I'll, I'll stick to the general question. Um, but of course, that is a very good example of uh, the possibility that uh, at certain points in time and in specific cultural situations, a, a certain expressive form can be taken up uh, consciously and programmatically uh, to reach a certain effect, not only in formal, but also in material terms, in terms of content, content and communication. Uh, as far as the general question is concerned, um, uh, for instance, uh, the constant oscillations in Montaigne's essays is considered to be an integral element to his way of philosophizing. That is to say, that is uh, way that is style of writing. Style is a difficult word. Um, his way of putting down his faults in his essays uh, is not casual, is uh, part of uh, the process by which he does philosophy and he conveys his philosophy to the reader. And, and so in this case, I think it would be. Um, so this is not uh, the fact of writing an essay or a poem or a novel, because you could put into the novel, they say, the, the poem, a certain way of writing uh, that is integral to your way of philosophizing. Uh, I, I think that uh, in some cases, for instance, uh, uh, poetical uh, philosophy, so to say, uh, like uh, certain works that have uh, a, an aura, an aura like Jakob Böhme's works, uh, a sort of uh, uh, constant allusion in the language, in the syntax, in the connections, in the way passages are, uh, in, in which you move from step to step in the reasoning and so on. Uh, 
that give a certain flavor to that philosophy, which again is an integral element to that philosophy, something like that you find in certain examples of philosophical poetry. Um, the problem is many people think that this is a bad kind of philosophy. So when you do philosophy in that way, you're simply, uh, you are simply uh, obscuring your reasonings to, uh, uh, to jeopardize the ability of the audience to, uh, to criticize uh, the reasoning itself. And so it would be it would be difficult to advocate this. Uh, many uh, many writers of philosophical poetry seem to think that there's a quickness to poetry, that uh, that uh, the the way you write treatises uh, uh, does not allow. Okay. So for philosophical poetry has something in common with. The, Aphoristic writing. But this is just a tentative answer. Can I, so. can I press a question here? So you might think that there is a distinction between what capacities of the mm -hmm. mind you're engaging in. You might think that poetry requires the use of the imagination um, and not just the intellect, which on the one hand, um, along the, the lines of the previous question about the quarrel, you might say they're completely opposed, mm -hmm. but maybe someone could say they're not just opposed in, in poetry, you just add some imagination to, in philosophical poetry, you add imagination to the intellect. Is that something that transpires in any meta discussions about poetry in this period? Everyone who discusses uh, this, uh, this theme in the early modern time uses such coordinates, of course, because it's the way you speak about these sort of things. Poetry is uh, memory or, imagine, or imagination, but memory is a function of imagination. So even Bacon would, would, uh, would allow the fact that the, the distinction is not so sharp. Uh, although his tripartition, as we all know, uh, separates them and separates the two different disciplines. Uh, yet, Yet, uh, I have no personal idea on that. Uh, um, I, as I think many people uh, would maintain, I don't think that the psychology of faculty is, uh, of faculties is uh, a proper language to speak about uh, uh, human mind. Uh, <laughs> Of course, uh, you can connect the ideas that poets or philosophers have on poetry and on the possible uh, intellectual content of poetry with uh, a, a marriage between Cadmus and Harmonia or intellect and, uh, and, uh, and uh, imagination, but it's... Uh, it's such a common scheme that I think would not tell you anything about mm. uh, what uh, what really is at stake. Fair enough. Uh, Donna Even has... whether something is at stake or it's just that they write some poetry. I see. I see. Uh, Donna has a finger. So that a well? woman will get yeah, into it. I, I have a finger here, and I want to press a bit Claudia's point. I think it is important uh -huh. to talk in terms of faculty psychology because that's how they talk about it. And what you said that, you know, for example, Bacon didn't distinguish sharply between reason and imagination, an art of reason and art of imagination is precisely which makes philosophical poetry possible. Otherwise, philosophical poetry would be impossible. You would either do poetry or philosophy. Now, there are a number of ways in which one can try to I don't know, put together a sort of definition of poetry that we are dealing with. And some were already raised here. So I would, I would follow a bit on the, so I think there is a, there is a kind of, there's a kind of contrast here between going with a form and the poetic, uh, the Aristotelian definition of poetics or going with the platonic suggestions that were made here. And if we go with the suggestions uh, that were made here regarding Plato, 
then um, there are very important category of, of poems that you find in Plato, namely the fables or the myths uh, that go along all the way until the end of the Renaissance as poetry. They are theorized as poetry, namely, anyway, so, you know, fables. Namely fables. fables. Namely fables, I'm not defining mm -hmm. them, but that would make all the utopias. I didn't make it up, Dana wrote it in the chat. Um, uh, but, you know, th this will make uh, all the stories that uh, we were talking before, you were talking before with Dan, philosophical novels. They are not philosophical novels, they are fables. And as fables, they are poetry, and they were theorized as poetry of the Platonic kind, in the same way in which, you know, the New Atlantis, so Bacon is the author of a famous poem, the New Atlantis because that's a fable, because according to the tradition of the fables, this is poetry. Now, what do fables have that is interesting here? There are works of imagination, but there are works where imagination is complemented by reason because they appear in philosophical dialogues. So they're exactly the points where uh, philosophers are searching the use of imagination and they have something else if we go with the Platonic uh, tradition. They are in divinely insp inspired. Now, whatever you want to make of this divine inspiration, it's a kind of the mind gets out of itself. Now, there is a sense in which in poetry, this is one of the important things, and it still is. The divine inspiration is something that gets the mind out of its regular uh, proceedings out of the syllogism, out of the um, scholarly work that we all do. And the, this flight of imagination leads to the truth. The contemporary equivalent of fables are modern cosmologies, I would say. So that's where it, it connects with science and so on. So again, that's a way of, of thinking of poetry that would put together Plato's dialogues with Dante's Divine Comedy and Milton that Dan Garber was putting together and, and, and that was quoting and then Bacon, but not the Bacon necessarily of the, of the world with the bubble, but the Bacon of Atlantis and so on and so forth. And, you know, um, early modern um, works of imagination about the cosmos and so on, in verse or not. And of course, Lucretius is part of this tradition. Yeah. Okay. You raised three points, if I got it wrong, <laughs> correctly. So one is a problem of definition. The second one is a problem that connects to the original uh, meaning of poesis. And the third is inspiration. So I start with the first one. I, I'm not using any particular definition of, uh, of poetry. Um, I'm not particularly interested in doing it. Uh, and in particular, I'm not interested in uh, crafting or uh, borrowing some definition of poetry that could be connected to some crafted or borrowed definition of philosophy so that you put them together and um, disregarding which one is the genus and which one is the species, but could uh, allow us to define uh, theoretically philosophical poetry. Mm, it's not what I'm doing, although I recognize that one could be do it. Um, one could do it. Um, but to say I'm not so interested in a theory of philosophical poetry, I'm more interested in, in the fact of philosophical poetry. Um, facts are more stubborn than theories, and, and so it's more interesting to, to consider them. Um, I, I completely agree with the third point that you raised, so that, uh, that in the Platonic tradition, there's a wide space for poetical production, in particular in the Neoplatonic strand of that tradition where inspiration is so important and it uh, 
it remains so important even for poets who do not consider inspiration as being divine or do not share platonic tenets in general. So I, I, I perfectly agree with that. And uh, uh, I'm not so sure that uh, this is a general property of, uh, of poetic production. Okay. Uh, but it would be a very long discussion and I'm already giving too long answers. So the other point is uh, poesy as production uh, and then as uh, literary creation and so fables are poems. Fables are poems, uh, uh, it could be, this reasoning could be constructed in a way that in the end I could, uh, I could, I could consider Russell's Principia Mathematica as a poem. And it's, uh, it's even written with the acapos, and so it's easy to say. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's not so practical. Uh, as Since I'm doing a historical kind of work, uh, I would take uh, as poem what people would at that time would have recognized as poem, and no one would have considered the, the New Atlantis as a poem. Uh, uh, Paul Lodge mentioned in the chat Coleridge, for instance. Um, uh, the the romantic English poets uh, wrote a lot of different philosophical Antonio. things, uh, but they would distinguish very clearly which one were uh, poems and which one were not, even if some of them were uh, put in the form of a fable. A fable would be a poem if it was written in a way and would be not a poem if, if it was written in another way. And I speak in my historical work to this kind of distinction. So uh, historically uh, grounded distinctions. But I agree with you that there's no reason why uh, in general one should not say that fables are poems. And this allows me to mention another name that I, I, I did not mention in my presentation, that is La Fontaine, of course. Because in La Fontaine, there's a philosophization, an explicit philosophization of some of the themes of ancient fables, that of course is in relation to that branch of French philosophy, which are the French moralists, who use, uh, by the way, uh, forms of philosophical writings that are peculiar to them as uh, there are forms of philosophical writings that were peculiar to Renaissance emblematics, that is another form of moralist philosophy. Of course, uh, we are all aware of all these different things. I'm uh, just, Montaigne says, and it's my motto when I'm a teacher, je n'enseigne, je raconte. So that's pretty it. I just wanted to mention that there is someone who did put New Atlantis on verses in the 17th century. Yes, <laughs> of course. Then you have a poem. You clearly read it as a poem to put it on verses. Okay, so let's move from the, the world of theory to the world of facts. There is a question from Rodolfo who had to leave and I'm, I'm going to just quickly read it for, for YouTube. Rodolfo was um, asking if the people who um, were writing and reading poetry uh, sort of changed in between the 16th and 18th century. If uh, previously philosophical poetry was more a form of entertainment among highly literate circles, and then in the 18th century becomes a tool of uh, propaganda and uh, popularization of new ideas, would you agree with this description? Well, this, this question contains also a, a set of other questions that were raised in the chat that all connect to the changing uh, landscape of literary expression and of the reception of literary forms and the role that literary forms can have in the societal role of uh, disciplines like philosophy, poetry, and so on. Uh, I started uh, in my presentation says, saying, and what of poetry today, huh? Uh, of course, philosophy is, is not the same thing that it was in the 
uh, 17th century and also poetry is not what it was in other times. Now poetry is a specialized activity that, have, that has forms that do not speak to everybody. Um, or at least it appears to us that it is so. There was a time in which uh, the prevalent way uh, uh, university philosophers would express themselves was that of the uh, Coimbra handbook. Then there were centuries in which no one would write philosopher, philosophy in that way. And I, I think this kind of study uh, helps in uh, historicizing a bit our ways of doing philosophy and writing philosophy. First, in, recognizes, in recognizing that even in our time, different ways of doing philosophy cohabit together with the academic university way of doing it. And that uh, it is not impossible that future historians of philosophy will see also different forms of philosophy in our own time, even if they are marginal to our present eye, professional eye. And uh, of course, this happens with poetry too. It, it is in the end, uh, the time in which Bob Dylan was awarded a Nobel Prize for literature. And, and so I, I might quote, uh, I might quote, uh, um, in bus, sta bus stations, according to him, where people talk of situations. Uh, it's uh, a song by Bob Dylan about success, uh, uh, interpretation of uh, human situations and so on. Mm, something that begins my love uh, something. Uh, I, I can't recall it precisely now. Uh, which has some philosophical content that, of course, Dylan borrowed by his readings of, uh, of the time. Uh, it's not worse than La Fontaine, if I may say so. Uh, when I was young, I, I thought it was much better than La Fontaine, indeed. Uh, so, of course, things change with time, but it's, uh, we should uh, carefully avoid to uh, take a Hegelian point of view on the about concerning the change of things in time. Cha things do not change in time to reach the present state of things. Things change in time also beyond the present state of things. And, uh, and, and so, and, and that's one of the lessons you gather from, from uh, that anthropological, anthropological differences that we, that we can find uh, looking at the past. Good. Um, Ville Paukinen, would you want to uh, bring up the point about the um, audience of poetry? Yeah, the size of the audience of poetry? So thanks. I, I guess it's been addressed already by Enrico. Hi, Enrico. Um, Hi, Ville. Uh, namely that the, uh, Put the, the audience... Put the on, please. Oh, let's see. Let's see. Hopefully the internet doesn't crash. So just to see each other for a couple of seconds. Hi. That's right. Happy so just you. the point that the audience of poetry nowadays is almost as minuscule as the audience of philosophy was in the, especially in the 18th century and to some degree, I suppose, in the Renaissance as well. The audience for both was quite large, right? It was not the case that Poetry was the huge bestseller and no one read philosophy. It was both were widely known and read due to the way that they were presented. But per perhaps another note, which is unfortunately not a question, but maybe still worth making is that regarding still Lisa Shapiro's, Lisa's question, is there anything special about the form of poetry that contributes to the argument that that's something that philosophy would be lacking? Uh, some, I think sometimes there's a presupposition that philosophy is about arguments, whilst poetry isn't. But I'm not so sure that that's always the case. Think about Wittgenstein's Tractatus. Are there, is there a single argument? I don't think so. It's argumentative, but it's not presented as arguments. Or Pascal's Pense. There are some arguments, but most of it is philosophical insights. Now, that, that doesn't make it poetry, for sure. 
but I suppose the question, well, maybe it brings something more to the question. What is there in philosophical poetry that's missing in philosophical prose, even if it's, it looks like poetic in the outset? That's a great approach. Um, I'll, 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 uh, I'll circumnavigate it. And I'll offer uh, three non-answers in lieu of an answer. Uh, first one, a point that no one raised is theater. So, uh, uh, of course, there's a lot of theater that has poetical characters and, and even now musical theater is written in, uh, in the ancient forms of, uh, of metrical uh, uh, accents and rhymes and so on. And some of that production has uh, some, some philosophical content. Uh, of course, uh, it could be despicable or good, uh, but, uh, but again, La Fontaine and so on. Uh, so, uh, so, of course, there is some poetry that is still listened to and is still uh, a reason of interest and, uh, and has people make money on it. So it has some importance. Uh, second point, uh, uh, where someone to put uh, uh, some parts of the Tractatus uh, into music? What would happen with it? Would it gain a, a, a poetic uh, uh, character? As a matter of fact, Socrates discusses the fact that he's uh, told in, in the dream to, to do music. And first he thinks that philosophy is the highest form of music because philosophy commands the, the music and so on. Apollo is the father of the music, is uh, the leader of the music and so on. Um, so, and, uh, and I, I see in the, in the uh, chat that Paul Lodge raises uh, the, the habit of uh, um, philo philosophy students and even of philosophers to put uh, philosophy, not only analytic philosophy, but and I the philosophy into songs. And yes, it is a kind of expression that has some success, at least in uh, American universities. And, uh, and, and so the question can be reason. Uh, would the philosophy, put, if put into music, gain a poetical character, even if it was not written with poetical forms in mind? A colleague of mine, Federico Petrucci, which is a very good historian of ancient philosophy has uh, proposed in the first seminar that we did an analysis of some passages in Timeo where he can see that the rhythm of the sentence uh, uh, is analogous to that uh, of, of poetical expression and there's a choice of, uh, uh, of words uh, that mimics uh, poetical production, so that you have a sort of embedment of, of poetical forms in the prose of Timaeus. I'm not able to, to judge it, but I, I have absolute trust in him, so I think it's true, and this is, and this is very interesting. Uh, thank you, Paul. Paul has uh, uh, just put in the, in the chat uh, the very longer URL that I cannot repeat here of uh, a uh, uh, of a rewriting and ad an adaptation of Tractatus as, a, as an avant-garde comic opera. So you can Google you that follow the YouTube, uh, the YouTube version of our seminar, uh, Google avant-garde comic opera Tractatus Wittgenstein and most likely you'll find this. Thank you, Paul. Um, Bill, do you want to ask your question about memory and poetry? Are you still? Uh, it was it was more of an ob observation, just that before printing, uh, poetry uh, wasn't always artistic. It was just a mimnot. It was also a mimnotic device to keep facts in your head, um, and that after printing, so uh, it, it was more just an observation. Uh, do, you, the theory of justice, the musical, has also joined the chat. Uh, for anyone following on, on YouTube. Yeah, Justin, thank you. 
Okay, anyone who feels and, that. And uh, okay. again, for people who do not see the chat, Justin uh, reminded us that in Wikipedia you find uh, an entry on A Theory of Justice, the musical that everyone can be referred to. Perfect. Um, anyone who feels that they want to add to um, to any of the previous discussions, there were a lot of questions in chat that were sort of replying to each other. Uh, Dan, do you want to say something? May I, may I make a caveat before the question? From now on, I will answer only easy questions, please. I, I thought you would say you would only answer in verse. <laughs> I, 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 I'd love and try, but I, 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 I didn't receive the education of a 17th century person. Uh, Dan, you're muted. No, still muted. Then the mic. I was once on stage with Jonathan Bennett, um, who, um, when somebody asked him a question he didn't like, he put his, his arms like that and he said, I'm retired now. I don't have to answer questions I don't like. Next. <laughs> You're not retired, so you can't do it quite yet. But uh, this isn't a hard question. This is this is a suggestive way of sort of thinking about poetry and um, philosophy. One of the one of the difficulties that came up, of course, in your your discussion with Donna, was the question of what is poetry anyway? What is your conception of poetry? What counts as poetry? Uh, the other the other. Um, um, side of that is, of course, what is it that counts as philosophy? What is philosophy? If you have an extremely narrow conception, you know, of what philosophy is, it's going to be very difficult to, you know, do, for example, a couple of questiones from, uh, from um, St. Thomas's Summa in, um, um, in poetry. It just doesn't fit. It's not going to fit anything. Um, and what I was suggesting on the, and I think that this is an interesting comparison. Part of what it is that, um, part of what it is I think that um, is going on with Montaigne in the same period is he is inventing, he invented the form of the essay in part because other forms, including philosophical forms, just simply didn't capture the kind of insights that he wanted to be able to communicate, um, th that he wanted to be able to express. And I think that one can see the, one can read perhaps uh, Montaigne as attempting to use a new form, a new literary form to expand the subject matter of what it is that philosophy is. And I think that one might think profitably about philosophical poetry in this way as not an attempt just to take philosophy as we understand it and put it and combine it with a literary form, but in a certain sense, change both poetry and philosophy in doing that adopting a new way of expressing um, one's ideas precisely because they couldn't be expressed um, um, in more traditional forms. And I think somebody like Bruno, for example, might, might and, and his philosophical poems might be seen in this light. You don't have to answer that if you don't want. <laughs> I, I I won't answer. In fact, I just bring the example that is very dear to me of Erasmus of Rotterdam and the literary forms he used to convey philosophy that he partly developed that uh, on a on a on an important part were his own faults and so were originally pieces of philosophy that he put into the colloquia so 
dialogues that you read the, to, to learn Latin, uh, and of course in the, in the Adagia, so explanation of Proverbs in which he would put a whole treatise on uh, peace and, uh, and, uh, and war or on uh, tyrannic government or, or anything like that. And, and, and which of course were one of the great inspiration of Montaigne's to, to, to choose that literary form for his own concealed transmission of his own thoughts. So that's to say I agree. Good. Um, okay, if, is there anyone else who wants to make a point? And it's too bad that we don't have a direct link to the uh, Tractatus, uh, the comic. Um, well, if not, we'll uh, thank Enrico. Maybe uh, unmute yourself. Oh, so it's I that, I that I thank. <laughs> Everyone must clap now. Um, so if you could unmute yourself for that purpose, that'd be good. Okay. Um, and um, I guess see you next week. I forgot what we have next week. We have the uh, a panel on philosophical wonder next week with um, quite a lot of participants. So we'll see what happens then. Okay. Thank you, everyone, Beautiful. for your question. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Claudia, Thank you very and much. Dan, yeah. for the seminar. Thank you. Bye bye. Ciao a tutti. Okay.